This is the Roller Coaster Podcast, and I'm your host, Lucy Q. Life is a wild ride. It has twists and turns. It's scary, exciting, and downright fun. So throw your head back, arms in the air, and come along with me for the ride. Life is like a roller coaster, baby. parent, it's hard enough to see your child struggle with everyday trials and tribulations. I can't imagine how heart-wrenching it would be to have a child addicted to drugs and alcohol. Where would you turn for help? Richard Capriola has been a mental health and addictions counselor for over two decades and is joining me today to chat about his book, The Addicted Child. Hi, Richard. Hi, Lucy. Thank you for inviting me to the program. I appreciate you taking the time to chat with me. It's my pleasure as, um, as parents of, well, they're not kids anymore. They're, they're young, young adults, 19 and 22. Um, you know, we had our fair share of, of struggles with our kids. Yeah. Uh, our youngest uh, was diagnosed at an early age with a very extreme form of dyslexia. And um, our oldest went through uh, abuse and um, not abuse, um, bullying. And, you know, both of them developed different forms of anxiety because of what they'd been through. Those are really, really hard things to navigate as a parent. And there are no roadmaps. But to add a layer of something as challenging as addiction, I can imagine it would be very challenging for for parents to even begin to figure out how to help your child it is very difficult it's very stressful it's 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 a scary subject and many times uh accompanying a child using a substance like alcohol or marijuana or an illicit drug is an underlying psychological issue. It might be depression or anxiety. It might be some type of trauma or being bullied. Uh, so not in every case, but in some cases, there are these underlying issues which can complicate the diagnosis and the treatment. Now, you, you were... Uh... <clears throat> a counselor for two decades. What led you to focus in on addiction in adolescence? Well, I was hired uh, to be an addictions counselor uh, by Menninger Clinic in Houston, Texas. Menninger Clinic is a large psychiatric hospital uh, that focuses on both adolescents and adults. And I worked there for over 10 years. Uh, and I was an addictions counselor for both adolescents and adults. Prior to that, I had worked in a large regional mental health crisis center uh, where I noticed a lot of people had uh, psychological issues as well as substance abuse issues. But during my tenure with Menninger, when I would meet with parents and, and talk to them about their child's history of using a substance and give them the diagnosis of a substance use disorder, uh, they would look at me and, and, and some of them would say, I had no idea this was going on. Or if they did suspect their child was using a substance, they would say, I sort of thought something was going on, but I didn't think it was this bad. So after I left Menninger, I wanted to put together a resource that was non-technical, a uh, very simple uh, book that runs about 100 pages, but yet is packed with information that I hope parents will find informative and helpful and, 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 and help, help them get a sense that they understand this issue a little better. They're not as frightened of it. And if needed, they feel prepared to deal with it. That's the goal of this book. Now you mentioned, you know, the the warning signs or parents not being able to see the warning signs at yeah. the beginning. What are some of those early things that might be easy to miss? Well, um, in my book, I have warning signs for a child that might be using alcohol. There's warning signs for a, a child that might be using marijuana. There's also warning signs for a child that might be developing an eating disorder or self-harming because sometimes these can accompany a child using a substance. Uh, but, but as a general rule, what I recommend to parents is pay attention to the changes that you see in your child. You know your child better than anyone. So pay attention to the changes that you see. Don't 
don't assume that the changes are normal adolescent acting out. They may very well be, but they also may be an indicator that there's something else going on underneath the surface. And the more of these changes that you see and the longer these changes go on, the more concerning it could be. So pay attention to these changes. Some examples would be uh, a child whose grades are declining, uh, a child who used to participate in sports now no longer wants to participate, a child who was very outgoing and verbal now becomes very quiet and secretive and isolating, and a child who uh, freely uh, introduced you to their friends. You knew who their friends were. You might have even known who their parents were now becomes very secretive of their friends. So these are all changes that you need to pay attention to and, and the duration of them. The longer you see these changes last and the more of these changes that you notice, uh, the more concerned you should be and, and probably move forward to get uh, an assessment done. How do you begin to have those conversations? Because kids, when they're going through those critical teen years, they can change drastically overnight and from minute to minute just because of what their hormones are doing. Yes. So even bringing up some of the simplest of conversations with the teen can be challenging in itself. How would you even begin to explore whether or not your child does have an addiction problem without, you know, throwing fuel on the fire? Right. You, that's a very good question. You don't want to come at it from an accusing point of view. You don't want to accuse the child of doing anything or condemn the child for behavior that, that, that you're seeing. What the best approach is, is to um, learn and practice good listening skills. And by that, I mean, we're pretty good at listening to other people's words when we speak to them. So when we're talking to our child, we're pretty good at listening to the words, but we're not so good sometimes at listening to the feelings behind those words. And that's a skill that every parent can practice and every parent can learn. So that when we're talking to our child, we're hearing not just their words, we're hearing their feelings. So when you're having this discussion, uh, about your child's possible use of a substance, you want, you want to do it from an inquiring point of view, from an inquiring mind, from a point of curiosity. Point out the observations and the changes that you see in your child and just let your child know that you're curious about those. And can you help me understand what I'm seeing? Can you help me, you know, get a better perspective on this? So rather than coming down on the child or accusing the child, you take the standpoint of being a curious inquirer. Your child is much more likely to respond to that than if you come down and you accuse accuse the child of doing something and you condone or, or you you don't condone the behavior, you become critical of it. Take an inquiring position because really that's what you're doing. You want to know more about why you're seeing what you're seeing from your child and you want your child to help you understand that. How do you break through the, you know, the initial reaction, the knee-jerk reaction when you're you're trying to understand somebody's feelings and where they're coming from is that their first reaction is to pretend that everything's okay and come come back with a canned response of no everything's fine i'm good you know don't worry about it it's you know everything's fine how well, do you again, kind of break through that yeah I, th I think you have to point back to the 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 behavior changes that you're observing and, and point those out to the child and say, you know, I'm curious as to why I'm seeing these behaviors. I'm curious as to why this is going on and that's going on. Can you help me understand it? So you're not accusing the child of anything. You're saying what you have observed and what you have seen. And rather than make a judgment on that, you're asking the child to help you understand it. Now, that might, that might take several several conversations before it sinks into the child that you really are concerned and that you really care about their point of view. Uh, it, it may not go very well the first couple of discussions, but the more you keep at it and the more you keep coming from an inquiring point of view, the more likely that child eventually will turn around and, and talk to you about what's really going on. Now, I'm sure some parents would be tempted to go poking around their kid's room when they're not around 
to see if they could find any clues. Is that a good move or a bad move? Well, I mean, the, the child is going to look at it as being an invasion of their privacy, but you're the parent, okay? You have the right to investigate anything that you're concerned about. Um, you certainly have the right to, uh, to, to investigate whether or not there's drugs in the house. You have the right to, uh, to, to explore whether or not your child is hiding drugs in their room or alcohol in their room. That, that, that is your right as a parent. Um, the child is going to look at it as an invasion of, of, of their privacy, but you're the parent. You have to take responsibility for keeping your child safe and doing what you feel comfortable uh, doing and what you think needs to be done. Do you find that there's some kids that are more prone to this than others? I would say that all children, all children are vulnerable to uh, abusing and using illicit substances and alcohol. All children are, are, are vulnerable. There are protective environments, but no child is completely protected. It doesn't matter whether uh, you live in an urban or suburban area or a rural area. It doesn't matter what your income level is or your education or the school that your child attends. All children are vulnerable to being captured up in substance abuse. Uh, and part of that is because of the availability of these drugs. When we ask kids, seniors in high school, when we ask them, how easy is it for you to get uh, a drug like marijuana? Almost 80% of them tell us it's very easy. They can find it, it's not a problem. When we ask them, how easy is it for you to get alcohol? Over 80% say, if I want alcohol, it's no problem being able to find it. And 30% of high school seniors tell us that it's very easy for them to find a drug like LSD if they want it. So these drugs are readily available and these kids know it. And on top of that, when we ask kids, how risky, how harmful do you think these drugs are? You'd be surprised, but they don't see these drugs as very harmful. You know, when we ask high school seniors, how harmful is it? Do you think that somebody smokes marijuana regularly? Only 30% of high school seniors tell us they think that's harmful. So wide availability of drugs and a very low perception of harmfulness is what's fueling some of the substance abuse that we're seeing today. And it's interesting that you bring marijuana up. Marijuana up. Uh, I'm actually in Canada where it's legal. So the perception around marijuana is very different than in other par parts of the world. So, you know, it's challenging enough to have a conversation with kids about alcohol because it is socially accepted. In Canada, there is still, you know, the first year that marijuana was, was legal, um, there was still a certain level of, you know, it not necessarily being accepted by everyone. It's, it's, it's changed a lot since then. How, I'm just trying to figure out how you would have those conversations with your children between you know, what you can legally do as an adult and what you do as an adult versus, you know, what your child can do. Yes. And, and, and children are going to want to know what's the difference. Okay. Marijuana is legal uh, in many states in, in the United States um, for adults. Uh, alcohol is legal after a certain age. So kids are going to want to know, well, what's the difference? I mean, it's okay for you. Why is it not okay for me? And that's where the focus needs to turn towards uh, the neuroscience and, and the brain development. Because the big difference is that the adolescent brain is much more vulnerable than the adult brain. Our, our brains become fully developed around age 24, 25. So when we're talking about an adolescent brain that is in the process of developing it and, and, and developing these critical areas of the brain that are going to be important in adulthood, 
it's important that we protect the brain. And kids need to understand that their brain is developing and they need to understand what these drugs can do to a developing brain. So the answer to the question of why is it any different for me than it is for you as an adult is the brain. Your brain as an adolescent is very vulnerable. It's in the process of developing uh, connections and, 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 and maturing and giving you the skills and the abilities that you will need later in life. So when, when they say, well, what's the difference between you drinking alcohol or you using a drug which is legal for you and, and why is it illegal for me? It's because your brain is still developing, which means you are at a higher risk of doing damage to your brain if you engage in these substances the developing brain does that because it's it's still growing does that does that mean that it's easier for a child to become addicted as opposed to an adult absolutely almost all addiction almost all addiction begins in adolescent years uh, very few people become addicted to a substance after age 21 or 25, with the exception maybe of prescription drugs or opiates. But almost all addiction has its beginnings in the adolescent years. And a part of that is because of the brain development, the vulnerability, and, 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 and the adolescent brain is, is not developed to the point where the adolescent is able to make good rational decisions. And after a parent starts to have those conversations with their child and, and, and they're coming to the realization that, yeah, there, there's something bigger here that we need to deal with, what should be their next step once they establish that there's a problem that's probably beyond their skill set to help resolve? The next step is to uh, get a comprehensive assessment. And I have an entire chapter in my book that, that talks about the different assessments that a parent should get done. Because all treatment, all effective treatment begins with a comprehensive assessment, an accurate diagnosis, and a treatment plan, which guides you in terms of what you do next. So the first step is to get the assessments done. For example, you'll need an addictions assessment from a, from a professional like myself. That's going to give you the information about the substances your child's using, how often they've been using, at what age did they begin using, and whether the diagnosis of a substance use disorder is mild, moderate, or severe. Um, or if there's any diagnosis. So you need an addictions assessment. You also need a psychological or a neuropsychological assessment to examine whether or not there's any underlying emotional issues that might be driving your child to use a substance. Is there a high level of anxiety? Is, your, is, there, is there depression? Is there some type of trauma or bullying going on? So that psychological assessment is important because it will either rule in or rule out whether or not there's underlying issues that might be driving your child to use a substance. And when you're talking about treatment plans, you know, for, for adults, most of us are aware of things like AA yeah. to help adults through the process. Do those same 12-step programs work for adolescents or do they need a completely different plan of attack when it comes to dealing with something like this? Well, every child is different and the treatment plan is going to give you direction in terms of what kind of treatment is needed. Uh, some kids uh, may do very well in an outpatient treatment program where they see somebody maybe on a weekly basis. Some children might need uh, what we call an intensive outpatient program where they see somebody multiple times a, a year, a week. And then for some with uh, a severe addiction or severe underlying issues, they may be looking at a residential placement that might go on for months. So it, it, there is no one treatment that fits every child. Uh, that's why it's important to get these assessments done so that you have some direction as to which treatment uh, approach is going to be best for your child. Certainly, uh, AA uh, is available in many treatment programs and, uh, and in, in many outpatient programs, uh, similar to what we have for adults. Uh, but these are pretty well limited to add 
adolescents. Uh, so adolescents go to say an AA meeting or an NA meeting that's composed of adolescents only. But those are important components to any effective treatment program. Now, I would imagine that an addiction in a child goes beyond affecting just that child and the parents. It, it extends throughout the entire family. What are some of those impacts that you find when it comes to the family unit? Well, you're right. The, the addiction affects more than just the child who's using the substance. It affects the entire family system. And everyone is affected by a child's substance abuse. And that's why it's so important that if you're a parent, uh, that you uh, get support for yourself, that, it, that you have somebody that, that is there to support and encourage and help you. It might be a good friend. It might be a, another family member. It might be a professional, a counselor, uh, but it's very important that you take care of yourself and that you get the support and the help that you need as you go through this journey with your child. And also that you, you get the support and the help for other children in the family that might be affected by it because it's going to impact their lives too. So many times parents focus on the child that has the substance use. That becomes the priority. And in so doing, they neglect getting help for themselves and for the rest of their family. So my advice is if you're going through this journey with your child, make sure you're taking care of yourself, get the help and support that you and your family need. The families also go through um, levels of mistrust, because I can imagine from a child's point of view, they may feel somewhat betrayed by their parents for, you know, whether they're going into the room finding evidence of drug or alcohol use, uh, sometimes just bringing them to an outside facility for assessment can feel like a betrayal. It does. Um, you know, like I was saying earlier, I worked in a large psychiatric hospital serving adults and adolescents. Pretty much every adolescent who came into our program uh, was in opposition to being there. They were angry. Uh, they didn't want to be there. They weren't going to cooperate with us. But the parents held the line. They insisted that this needed to be done, and they brought their child into the hospital. Um, and, and what I noticed was over the period of three or four weeks that the child was there, there was a uh, a turning around of the child's attitude that initially while they were oppositional, uh, as they went through the treatment and through the assessment and through the groups, their attitude and their behavior significantly changed so that by the time they left, they were, they were more open to treatment. Now, some were still resisting it, but the majority were open to treatment and had begun the process of healing and getting better. I can imagine that, you know, when the child goes through that period of, of breaking through, that they're maybe realizing that they're being heard for the first time, their problems are being acknowledged, that they're, they're real. And that's maybe where the, they start gaining trust in, in the people around them that are trying to help them. Yes, absolutely. When, when the child begins to, to understand that people are listening to them, that people are understanding them, that their point of view is being heard, then I think that goes a long way towards the healing and the recovery that, that, that can come along. And I think that's, that's something that we all look for as human beings is just simply to be heard and to be understood. Absolutely. We all want to be heard. We want people to not just hear our words, but also to hear uh, our, our feelings so that when we're talking to somebody, uh, we get the idea that they truly understand us. And, and that comes about when the person that we're speaking to hears not just our words, but hears and reflects back the feelings that are underneath those words. The validation. The validation, exactly. Now you're, you're providing families with a really important roadmap to navigating a very challenging situation. Where's the best place for people to connect with you? 
I would recommend they go to the book's website. Uh, the book's website is www.helptheaddictedchild.com. And on that website, they will be able to read information about the book. Uh, there's also a parent workbook that they can explore. Uh, there are endorsements and book reviews. Um, and there is a link that will take them to Amazon where they can buy the book or the workbook. The book itself is available in a Kindle version, and it's also available in a paperback version, both at a very affordable price. And there's also a link where they can send me a message or ask me a question. So I would recommend that you go to the book's website, helptheaddictedchild.com, and there you'll find resources and information and a link to take you to Amazon to purchase the book. If you're looking at connecting with Richard, make sure you check out the show notes. I'm going to have all of, all of the links in there. And thank you, Richard, for joining me and sharing some very important information today. Thank you, Lucy. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me, and I appreciate your contribution to the discussion. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Roller Coaster Podcast. Want to chat or share your ideas about today's show? Pop me an email at hello at the rollercoasterpodcast.com. Don't forget to connect with me on Facebook and Instagram at the Roller Coaster Podcast. Our theme song, Roller Coaster, was performed by the Lucky Setback. Audio editing by the one and only Jeff Quigley of Quigley Creator. Life is like a roller coaster, baby. Love is like a roller coaster, baby.